Hello, I'm Dr. Gary Hill. I'm your professor for this class from Sinai to the Promised Land. I'm really excited about this class because we're going to study an important period in biblical history. As a matter of fact, uh, the Exodus is the reason, uh, the reason, and uh, we're going to be studying the text of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Joshua. We're going to be studying that so section of the Bible because it's all connected. Uh, the children of Israel at the end of the book of Genesis are in Egypt because of Joseph. He saved his family. Exodus begins with the children of Israel in slavery. They're enslaved. And uh, Pharaoh rose up who knew not Joseph. God called Moses, who was a prince in Egypt, to rescue his people. He came back to Egypt, he rescued his people, and uh, led them to Mount Sinai. And this is where we begin our class officially, but we want to do a little background study on why Israel wound up encamped around Mount Sinai as we begin the class, and we'll look from Israel around Mount Sinai all the way through the conquering of the Promised Land in our study together this summer. Well, let's begin by looking at Moses. We find a lot about Moses because of history. Of course, the Bible is history. Uh, the historical accuracy of the Bible has been proven by archaeological research. Uh, there's numerous evidences of uh, Egyptian and Canaanite history and Israelite history that point to the accuracy of the Bible story the book of Genesis, Exodus, all the way through Joshua. Uh, we're going to tell the tale of the tales. A tale is an archaeological dig site, a mountain, basically a hillside that's been buried through earthquakes and erosions and conquering of cities, and these cities are buried, and archaeologists have been able to come through and excavate and find what the people were like. Archaeology's greatest benefit to us is fourfold. Number one, it uh, illustrates and illuminates the scripture. Uh, we don't have anything like uh, tales in the United States. Most archaeology is done from the ground downward. Tales are buried cities, basically, in the Holy Land, and archaeologists uh, dig in a different way, use the same techniques, but dig in a different way to discover what these uh, civilizations were like. Also, you've chosen wisely as you've studied with us because archaeologist is archaeology is a great tool in defending the faith. There are a lot of skeptics in the world out there who would like to say the Bible's not historically accurate. It's full of myths. Israel wrote down these stories of many, many years, even centuries after they happened, to give themselves a history. But when you find discoveries after discovery that prove the historicity of the Bible or illustrate or show these things happen, then, of course, you can come away with greater faith. But again, let's give this caveat as we begin. Our faith is not based upon archaeology or science or anything else. Our faith, Romans 10, 17, beloved, is based upon the Word of God, the Word of God. Uh, our faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. But we can use these sciences and these other studies and these other uh, uh, intellectual uh, discussions to give us greater confidence that the Bible is the inspired Word of God. Our thesis always in all of our classes at the National School of Preaching and Biblical Study is that the Bible is inspired it's inspired of God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man or child of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into every good work. So let's see what archaeology and history tells us. First of all, if you go to Israel where Moses and Israel came from before they traveled to Sinai, you find that the civilization was based upon <coughs> the people's ability to live and flourish 
as they settled around the banks of the Nile River. As you can see in this one picture, the Nile River, all around the Nile River, you have flourishing civilization. You have cities, and you have crops, and you have houses, and you have all the things that make us civilization. But back behind these pictures, what do you see? You see a desert. There was no way a civilization could have flourished without the Nile River, <coughs> excuse me, without the Nile River uh, providing uh, the substance that the people needed. Even going back further than Moses, though, you have to go to Joseph. Joseph lived in the Egyptian history designation of the second intermediate period. This is 1800 to 1570 BC. This was the Hyksos period. The Hyksos were a group of Semitic people that had conquered the native Egyptian and ruled the country from 1800 to 1570. Joseph was sold to Potiphar by his brothers, accused wrongly by Potiphar's wife. He is thrown into jail, and as we know from the Bible story in the book of Genesis, he interprets the cupbearer and the Pharaoh's dream. And then finally he interprets Pharaoh's dream. When he interpreted Pharaoh's dream, Pharaoh made him second in command in all of Egypt because he predicted, which Pharaoh believed, the words of God which said that Israel was going to have seven years of flourishing plenty and then seven years of very sincere famine. So Jacob had to send his sons to Egypt. They were reunited ultimately with Joseph again. They didn't know Joseph at first. He had to tell him who he was. And uh, Israel, Jacob, and all his family uh, moved to Egypt. But a few years later, not really a few years, around 400 years later, in Exodus chapter 1, verse 8, we read in Scripture, Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, let they, lest they multiply and it happen in our event of war that they may also join our enemies and fight against us. So he was concerned that the Israelite population was growing. So Amos threw out the hated Hyksos power. Amos was the Pharaoh who knew not Joseph. Moses, though, was saved and grew up as a prince in Egypt. And he was, and he was brought up in his father's house for three months. But when he set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son. This all comes from the inspired historical account of Stephen in the New Testament in Acts chapter 7, verses 20 through 22. The passage ends by saying this, And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and was mighty in words and deeds. Moses was a highly educated man who ultimately was chosen by God to lead his people from Egyptian bondage. The date of the Exodus comes from 1 Kings chapter 6 and verse 1. 1 Kings is mentioning the rule of King Solomon. And in 1 Kings chapter 6 and verse 1, the scripture teaches the temple of Solomon was began in the fourth year of his reign. That would have been 966 BC, which was the 480th year after the Exodus. So there in that passage, 1 Kings 6 1, we have the date of the Exodus. And if we do the math, what it tells us is the Exodus happened in 1446 BC, which would have been the third year of Pharaoh Amenhotep II. Amenhotep II, who ruled from 1447 to 1421. Moses was taught in Egypt, Egypt's complex mythology and ritual. He was expected to believe that Pharaoh himself was a visible God. 
He was exposed to Egyptian literature, and for our purposes, we see God's providence at work here in saving his people and ultimately bringing the world Jesus. He knew how to write. And of course, we believe, and the Bible teaches very plainly, that Moses wrote the first five books of the Old Testament, and we'll be studying Moses' writings in this class from Sinai to the Promised Land. So he would have known the first female Pharaoh, Hatshepsut, who more than likely was the prince's mother that raised him. He would have known the III, who was the Pharaoh of the opposition, and he would have known certainly Amenhotep II, Amenhotep II, who was the Pharaoh of the Exodus. Moses fled to Midian. The Hebrews were under greater opposition. And then after that happened, you have Moses meeting God at the burning bush. There he was told to go and rescue my people. The call of Moses is found in Exodus chapter 3, starting in verse 5. Exodus 3, 5. I have surely seen the opposition of my people, the Lord said, who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up from the land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have seen their opposition with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. We found archaeological evidence of brick makers making bricks. We have a lot of archaeological elements and explorations of the false gods of Egypt, the emptiness and bankruptcy of the ancient Egyptian religion is not only witnessed in the crumbling temples that we can see today of the past, but the living biblical record that we're studying, the book of Exodus, which records for us one of the most magnificent encounters in all of ancient history. We have excavated and seen Hathor's temple, the Karnak Temple. We've seen the bull god that the Egyptians worship, the cow goddess, Hathor, Horus. They were the most polytheistic people in the ancient world, mostly somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 gods they worship. And the system of Egyptian idolatry was one of the worst ever. The Egyptians considered sacred the lion, the ox, the ram, the wolf, the dog, the cat, the ibis, falcons, vultures, hippopotamuses, crocodiles, cobras, frogs, and even scarabs and locusts. They considered Pharaoh as a god, begotten by the god Amun-Ra, also the son of Horus, the son of Hathor. So then you have the ten plagues. This is where our story begins to get close to beginning. All the ten plagues were against the various gods of Egypt. They were miracles, not natural disasters. They were all miracles. We know they were miracles because they had been predicted. We know they were miracles because of the intensification. The plagues got worse as Pharaoh hardened his heart again and again. They were miracles because soon the Egyptians were the ones being persecuted and Israel was left alone. And they were certainly miracles because of the moral purpose of God. The moral purpose of God, the reaction of the Egyptians showed that they knew these plagues were more than natural disasters. 
At the end of the third plague, the magicians commented, This is the finger of God. And while the eighth plague was threatened, the closest advisors of Pharaoh pled with him to release the Israelites, saying, If we don't, Egypt is ruined. They showed the impotence of Pharaoh as a ruler <laughs> and a god. He wasn't a god. His total lack of integrity, his stubbornness, his arrogance, and his morality are clearly shown in the narrative. So what, why, and what purpose did the ten plagues have? Number one, they were visual lessons to Israel regarding the worthlessness of idolatry. Number two, they were used by God to demonstrate his awesome power in redeeming his people. And number three, they show God's love and care for his people. In Exodus chapter 12 and verse 12, we read these words. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. God wanted Israel and Egypt. And God wants us today to know that he is the Lord. Exodus 7, 5. When we see God's power, his fame would spread throughout the earth. In the plagues, God would reveal himself. And he announced, I will bring judgment on the false gods, making sure the people knew he was the only God. God launched an elaborate, gradually intensifying program of disciplinary disasters against Egypt. The Nile was polluted. The river which was sacred to the Egyptians became a river of blood. Frogs came from the river. Kunum, the guardian of the Nile, and Happy, the spirit of the Nile, and Sorbet, the god of the waters, three of the Egyptians' gods, were shown to be false in the first two plagues. There was a plague of lice, the plague of mermon, the attack against the cattle, the plague of bulls, the plague of hell, the plague of locusts, the plague of darkness which was a direct strike against one of the mightiest of Egyptian gods, Ra, the god of the sun. What seemed to be described here is a storm of such proportion that the light of the sun was blotted out completely. And for three days, the Egyptian dared not leave the safety of their dwelling. Yet, in the land of Goshen, where Israel was, there was light. Ra is not a god. None of these were gods. Only Jehovah is God. And then finally, because of Pharaoh's hardness, the hardness of his heart, you have the tenth plague. Every firstborn of the land would die, including the firstborn of animals. Even the heir to the throne of Egypt would die. And a whale would go up such as Egypt had never before experienced. Ra, the sun god, Amun Ra, the king of the gods, Set, the god of the deserts and the storms, Hathor, the goddess of happiness, all of these gods were false gods. Even Pharaoh was a false god. So in conclusion, there's no power but God's power. He is the underlining reality. And as we come to know him, as we study from Sinai to the promised land, even better, we will see where the God who visited judgment on the gods of Egypt has the power to visit judgment over our captors too. And because he is a God of compassion, as we come to know him and to trust him, through his son, Jesus Christ, the Lord, we will be blessed. 
The plagues can be summed up, y'all, in the word no, K-N-O-W. The word becomes a key word in all the narrative that we're going to study. Throughout all the plagues, all parties would come to know Jehovah, know Yahweh, know the one true God. And to know God means to recognize him because of personal experience and then submit to his authority. So this is our introduction to Sinai. As we know, after the ten plagues, Pharaoh finally let the people go. As they were leaving, he chased after them in the chariots. God performed another one of his great miracles in drowning the Egyptian army in the sea. Then Israel marched on to Sinai. They were free. But God needed to give them a law. God needed to give them and teach them not only is that he is God, but how to live before God and then also live before their fellow man. And this is where the next part of our story begins as the fleeing and rescued Israelites are led by Moses. They're finally free to this great mountain in the desert. What's going to happen at Sinai will be our study next week. Thank you.